Hello. Um, well, I'll just make a quick video on Cameron syndrome, delayed puberty, and anosmia. Lack of sense of smell. Um, I made a few of these in the past, but I just haven't made one for a while. So I thought it was about time I just said hello to people and just to uh, to put some more information out there. I'm, I like to try and improve the awareness of the condition. It, now I'm getting older. It, I'm well, I was diagnosed when I was 23. I'm now 47. So um, I've been on treatment for almost uh, over 20 years now, but I like just to keep people aware of the condition, try and get, make sure people get diagnosed early and to make sure they're aware that this condition exists. And because even now people are being dismissed as like late developers or late bloomers because doctors aren't really aware of what Kalman syndrome or CHH is. I'm going to put some links in the end of this video just to provide some more information. Basically, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 23, so from the age of about 15 to 23, I was being told I was a late developer, late bloomer. I think I first went to the doctor around 16, after a school nurse had an examination, and, but every time it was, I'll oh, just go away, just wait and see, you're just one of the later ones. At that time, nobody asked people about sense of smell. I went to university, still undiagnosed. It wasn't until I started my first job at the age of 23 at the Royal Free Hospital in London that I met an endocrinologist there, and he was the first doctor who asked me, did I have a sense of smell? And from there, led to the diagnosis of Kalman syndrome. And from then on, I've been on either testosterone therapy or fertility treatments from the age of 23 to, to now. There's been a couple of years I wasn't on treatment at all, but... I do think it's best to be on treatment, even though testosterone isn't a vital hormone for life, you certainly feel the effects if you're not on it, and it's certainly better for your health, and especially for bone health and osteoporosis, if you're on testosterone. And the same goes for the women as well, where if you're not on estrogen or progesterone, you've still got the problems of osteoporosis. So even though some people don't go on treatment for choice, most doctors or care specialists do suggest you are on some form of treatment. Um, at the moment I'm still involved with patient groups on Facebook and I talk to people on Skype and Facebook and I meet them in person when I can. I really enjoy the chance of meeting fellow patients in the UK where I live and around the world. Because it's such a rare condition I think it's quite good and helpful for patients to be able to talk to other patients. I think that's the only way to get information about this condition out there. Even when we talk to care specialist doctors, they have little experience of talking and knowing what it's like to be a care patient. So the best way for care patients to find out is to talk to fellow patients. We occasionally hold meetings, patient meetings, either in the UK or the US, and there's a, pa there's a patient meeting coming up in Boston, United States, in October this year. So I'll leave more information about that in the notes. I think it's very helpful for at least patients to know that there are patients about, even if they don't have to talk to them, at least at least, at least have the knowledge that they're not alone with the condition. Um, the first thing about diagnosis is not to be dismissed as a late developer. Even though puberty can start at 17, if you do have some of like the other symptoms like anosmia, hearing problems, cleft lip, cleft palate, or some problem, there's or sometimes mirror movement on the hands and or under the testes or sometimes there are little symptoms that can happen as well as their delayed puberty or if there's other people in the family who are late that could give you a little bit more heads up that there could be a problem so even if somebody goes to 16 17 especially females 16 17 if they haven't started puberty it's probably a good idea to get seen by a reproductive endocrinologist and not just a normal GP may just say, I'll just wait and see. It's, it's early diagnosis and early treatment makes so much difference with this condition. I met my first fellow patient when I was 24 at the Royal Free Hospital in London, and he set up the first patient group, and he was very good in organising all the patient information and patient meetings then. I've tried to follow a little bit in, in that footsteps, because I really do enjoy meeting fellow patients and be able to talk to fellow patients. So I try and put information on the Facebook groups, 
and the website or the blog site I try and keep updated to just try to pass on information. Because there are fertility treatments available now. Um, I've been on fertility treatment twice as part of a clinical trial. Both times I've achieved fertility just about. Still subfertile, but better than the zero I am at most of the time. And not not every not every doctor knows about the fertility treatments being available. And sometimes patients are told there are no treatments available when there are available. So sometimes it's worth just doing a little bit of background checking to find out what there is available. There's different forms of testosterone treatment around. At the moment I'm on the gel, which is not my first choice, but there's but it, it's, it works very well. It's just a daily application of gel. There's like a long-lasting injection instead, um, the, the the Bido injection, which lasts about between 10 and 12 weeks. So sometimes I'm on that instead. But at the moment, I'm on the gel. In the past, I've been taking injections of Pregnil, which is human chorionic gonadotropin. And this makes your testes produce their own testosterone. So instead of taking tester gel, I take this three times a week and the testes produce their own testosterone. I find it very helpful being on this. I think for some reason I feel better being on the natural testosterone I get from Pregnal than I do from the, the testosterone gel and libido, but this is not always available. It's not too expensive, but it's not available in every country, and sometimes there are production issues where it's not always around, even though... But tester gel and the are available in virtually every country, or similar similar size rejections. So, really, have to be on some form of testosterone therapy. Being on testosterone itself doesn't cause fertility to happen, so you will still remain infertile. But there are specialised injections you can have after that. But then you have to be in the right place and have a doctor who knows what they're doing about that. But that's where patient groups come in handy. You can ask information about fellow patients who have been through fertility treatment. The I think the last thing I can mention is about the genetics and the inheritance. There's still a lot to be learnt about the genetics of Kalman syndrome. At the moment, last time I talked to one of the specialists and read the papers, there were about over 25 different genes or gene variants that being connected with cases of Kalman, Kalman syndrome and CHH. And they still cover less than, well, just about 50% of the cases. So there's still no genetic, there's no single genetic cause for Kalman syndrome. And it's very difficult to predict, if you go on fertility treatment, the chances of in passing on a condition because it could be one gene, two genes involved, and they may not know which gene it is. And it's very difficult for doctors to be able to save any certainty you will pass on Kalman's to, to your children. You can do, but it's very difficult to predict with any certainty. So that is something they're working on, and they're testing as many samples as you can find and searching if, there's, if there is a single genetic cause or genetic link to Kalman syndrome. At the moment, they haven't found one, but this, it is something they're working on. Um, I think that's about it I can do it for the moment. Um, I'll put some links in the notes, because if people want to find other patients... So we have three groups on Facebook of different security or privacy settings. It depends how if you want how much information you'd like to have on Facebook. And I've got a couple of web blogs. So I'll put some information on there just if people want to find out more or drop me a line anytime. There are other people who make YouTube videos who make far better videos than me, but far more I would say photogenic or better easy to explain. But there's other people who, so I'll put I'll put some notes in the in the groups as well. But if anybody wants to get in t- contact, I'm always online or I'm always happy to talk to patients anywhere. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.